Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Beta Boost Brain Serum. Beta Boost is your brain but better. Natural ingredients match your own endogenous chemicals and that they probably even cross the blood-brain barrier. After bringing together the world's best neuroscientists, nutritionists, and food scientists, we've created the first chemically tested and validated neuroenhancer and nootropic. Whatever your brain problem is, fogginess, tiredness, depression, concentration, or even intelligence, Beta Boost has you covered. Mention the keyword engage to receive 10% off your first 12 pack of Beta Boost. As you step up to the plate, you're not only entering a batter's box, but you're entering a, a mental chess match with the pitcher. He's studied your tendencies, you've watched his, and in less than half a second's time, you'll have to try to figure out where to put your bat in order to hit the ball. The best baseball players in the world fail at a rate between 60 and 70% of the time. That's why some of the quotes by players on hitting sounds almost magical. Uh, from, uh, for one, Yogi Berra thinks that uh, you can't think and hit at the same time. Uh, Pete Rose said that it's a round ball and a round bat, and you had to hit it square. Warren Spahn said that hitting is timing, and pitching is upsetting timing. Uh, and finally, Hawk Harrelson says that the more pitches you see, the more dangerous you become. Today I speak with Spencer Somer about baseball, hitting, and the brain. Uh, we'll discuss how findings from neuroscience and cognitive psychology may provide insight into how a baseball player should approach the play. So thank you for joining me. I'm with Spencer Sommer. Is it Sommer? Sommer. Spencer Sommer. Uh, sorry. Number nine, uh, starting third baseman for the Haverford baseball team. Currently batting uh, 322 with 13 RBIs uh, and has hit for the cycle uh, earlier this season. So somebody who knows a lot about the topic that we're talking about today, uh, the neuroscience of hitting. Uh, so as a baseball player, uh, what got you interested in uh, this topic? I mean, I've always been a baseball player. I've loved it ever since I can remember. And... I know I've, I've always spent so much time practicing all the physical things with baseball, like refining my swing, practicing in the off season. but I've never really considered the mental side of it, and it is such a mental game, and as everyone has already always said, mm -hmm. and I thought that that would be interesting to look at, especially as a hitter and through the mind of a hitter, as I can see it as a first person in the batter's box myself. Yeah, so. I, and uh, so looking at your research that you've done, what, what were some of the more interesting findings you've found so far? Well, I... A lot of the more interesting things were dispelling a lot of the, the ways I've been taught in the past. And so everyone always says, like, keep your eye on the ball. And what the truth is, uh, looking at a study that they made in Japan, they looked at uh, professional hitters and their eye paths, like, during an at-bat. And so they showed that actually, like, before a pitch and when the pitch is coming, most of the information that hitters gather is from looking at the pitcher itself and seeing physical cues and the release point and all that. And, and so it is a lot more than just keeping your eye on the ball. And mm -hmm. so that's another one thing that was really interesting. Another one is two strikes. A lot of uh, coaches tell you to uh, think, think curveball, react fastball. And through my research, I've noticed that a lot of the mistakes that people have made by, are by guessing pitches early and making that mistake. And so when a hitter is going through an at-bat and sees a pitch, and they guess curveball, for example, and they see a fastball, what comes into play is the working memory, and it's working the brain in places other than the motor planning central area. And so essentially it makes it harder for you to hit. And so by guessing curveball and getting the wrong, getting it wrong is, makes it harder. Yeah, so, so uh, batters shouldn't be predicting exactly. things. They should be reading the cues that... Other cues, and maybe count pitcher tendencies. Mm -hmm. Seeing spin is another one. Uh, so I think of baseball kind of like chess as a... like pitcher versus batter exactly uh, so if uh, I'm a batter trying to read your uh, cues that you're giving me as a pitcher are there things that pitchers are then trying to do to hide uh, their pitches yeah I mean a lot of pitchers they do they do there's a lot of mind games that go on back and forth mm -hmm. just with like physical cues like a lot of pitchers sometimes they work the ball in their glove a lot and they move their hands around so it makes the pitcher the batter start to think about something which is pretty smart based on my research which shows that like if a batter is really anxious at the plate and starts to think, then that's when they're at their worst. Mm -hmm. And so uh, stuff like that really shows like a kind of give and take between batter and pitcher. And I think that the biggest thing is it is like a chess match. Yeah. It definitely and, is. And in terms of the practice, so I would assume uh, as a 
uh, player for the Haverford team that you're getting pitches from your own uh, pitchers in practice a lot. Well, the, that's another thing. So a lot of times it's really hard to get like full, like real life at live action at bat practices. And so what from my research I've seen that like the best way to practice is by getting as many like close to zero variables at bats as possible. And so a pitcher can't really throw all the time because they have to throw in games. Right. And they're on their own schedule and they can't throw all the time because it's a wear on your arm. Yeah. So the biggest thing is that I've realized is in order to like make the most value out of practices, it's best to eliminate as many variables from an actual bat as possible. And so interestingly, this year my team has started to use like an overhand front toss as opposed to an underhand front toss, which simulates like the overhand release point of a pitch. And so I think that that has definitely helped in terms of my, my hitting. Yeah. So I think that that's been interesting. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. And um, do you think that there's any... Oh, you, so you've talked about dispelling some myths. Do you think that there's some mis other misunderstandings of uh, pitching and, and kind of the mind games of a, of, uh, a batter? I think that... Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but um, in Bull Durham, mm -hmm. there's a scene where uh, Kevin Costner is the main character, and he steps out of the box, and it's like in his mind, and he's like going through what he's thinking about and all this stuff. And the truth is that the biggest separation between a professional hitter and like a regular novice mm -hmm. is the amount of anx anxiety that's going through your mind before a pitch when you're in the batter's box. And so the fact that he's having all these thoughts is probably not right. Because yeah. in, in the truth is that the less anxiety you have and the less emotional responses you're creating, mm -hmm. the better you're going to be able at planning your hit. And so one of the biggest things I'm trying to do now is myself is going to the batter's box, clear my mind, mm -hmm. just focus purely on the motor planning and avoid any kind of anxiety. Yeah. And so that's something that a lot of coaches don't really understand, and I think that's something that they should. Yeah, and do you think that there's been a push more towards kind of studying game type of opposing pitchers? Uh, so kind of trying to pick up those tendencies that might give you the, the cue into what they're throwing rather than just looking at pitch tendencies or... Oh, I think that uh, another valuable thing you, as a batter you could do is in the batters in the on deck circle. It's like really underplayed a lot is the amount of like experience you can get just by watching a pitcher throw in okay. bef before. And so you see different arm angles and you can like know where the release point's going to be and see different types of pitches. Mm -hmm. Also, I like to talk to batters that have already faced the same pitcher yeah. and see what they say and anything. But I mean, as a D three player, we haven't really got like all the. <laughs> the camera work and everything, mm -hmm. but we get to talk to people who've seen the picture before, yeah. and so that's important. Yeah, uh, and so I, I have your video up here, the Neuroscience of Hitting on YouTube. Uh, what sort of public response have you uh, received from others that you shared the video with? Uh, well, I shared the video on my uh, personal Facebook, and I got a, a few, a, a bunch of likes and a few shares even, and after the college tweeted it out mm -hmm. um, for the Neuroscience Week or whatever, yeah. um, my coaches saw it and they loved it, and then Someone from the community, I think, like the vice president of communications at Haverford, mm -hmm. he reached out to me and was like, "Hey, like, I want to learn more about this. There's a reporter that's interested, but nothing's really going to come about yet." But yeah, I, it's kind of awesome. Yeah, he also emailed me and was like, uh, wondering uh, about contacting you for the the story. So I'd like to see, hope that yeah, uh, who the knows? reporter ends up uh, writing that up. But I saw over 200 views on. Um, on yeah, it's definitely had a lot of uh, good feedback. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when you uh, think about uh, the topic, do you think that there's any um, new or uh, interesting areas of research uh, that are looking at how we can improve hitting? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of like technological advancements that need to be made first because it's hard to give like an accurate fMRI image while a person is actually batting. Mm -hmm. But there have been a lot of research on this topic, and I think that the next step is that MLB scouts start using it in their work, and mm -hmm. so. One of the more tangible ways that it can be used immediately is in like the stop signal reaction time, where uh, these scouts can look at the amount, like how quick a person can react to a pitch and whether check their swing or not, and this can directly correlate to on base percentage, walks, and show like actual skills just based off like mental processes. And I think that if we keep doing research and we understand more, scouts can give like maybe a mental br breakdown of a player and scout them based on that. Because obviously, a player that's less anxious in some facet, maybe less, uh, I don't even know, but some less anxious might be better than a player that's all over the place. Yeah, as, so do you think that this like neuro baseball might fall into like kind of a money ball type 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of like the anti Moneyball, where Moneyball is like just purely based off the numbers, nothing in the background. Mm -hmm. But I think that it would take some value to get some kind of theory behind a lot of these numbers and see what makes a player good at walking. Like it has to do with their understanding of the strikes and the thoughts that go through their head during an at bat. And I think it's definitely something that could have value to professional teams. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the middle ground where it, it is statistics, but it's based on things that you're measuring from the player, and it's not yeah. just the their production. Physical, it's not the output, it's more like the input. Right, and it's not the uh, like gut feeling of a scout who yeah. has their experience yeah. picking up uh, people. Uh, and uh, so is there one last uh, like really important thing that you want to mention or communicate about your research? Um, I don't know, I just think that it's, what from what I've seen is that there's a lot of value to it, and it surprised me personally, and I think that the fact that I could like take this research and use it on the field immediately shows that there could be a lot of opportunity for this for scouts and for more professional ways and I think that that is interesting. Yeah and with two years left uh, well, and the rest of the season um, maybe some uh, it'll help you over time uh, to yeah, definitely. Uh, work on the, on the batting. So uh, as we wrap up here uh, it sounds like you have a conference opener coming up. Yeah uh, this weekend we have our first conference game we're going down to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, I'd like some support for the Haverford okay. Fords that'd be great. Uh, and when's the home opener? Uh, uh, home opener, I think, the week after we play SWAT, so our, okay. our rivals, yeah. first week, so that'd be good. Yeah, and that's uh, just down at the, the field? Yep. All right. Uh, so we'll, uh, I'll throw that on, on the, uh, the write-up. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for coming in. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Spencer for coming in and sharing his uh, insight and experience uh, as a baseball player uh, and a uh, budding neuroscientist uh, and looking at how we can apply neuroscience and cognitive psychology to uh, something like uh, baseball. Uh, so looking to wrap up the uh, show here with uh, the last two segments, we'll turn to Jake's Jams, uh, something I've been interested in uh, lately and about um, a little over a year, maybe a year and a half now, has been the app for podcasts called Stitcher. Uh, it's why I got into, or why I was interested in, in um, doing my own podcast was because I started listening to podcasts uh, last year when I had about an hour, hour and a half commute uh, on the Toronto Transit uh, up in uh, Toronto, uh, commuting from uh, my apartment to uh, one of two places, Baycrest Hospital, the Rotman Research Institute, and York University. Uh, so it took a while to uh, get to each of those places, and it was nice to uh, be able to listen to something since I had to transfer a few times. Uh, especially if I was going to York, uh, it was hard to get any work done. Uh, so listening to podcasts was a great way to spend my time. Uh, and uh, using Stitcher was the the way that I listened to those podcasts. So uh, I really appreciated Stitcher and, and found it uh, a great tool for podcasts. Uh, so going to the last segment, uh, or I guess non-segment of the show, uh, we'll look at uh, Twitter tweets or mailbag uh, and uh, reader mail. Uh, nothing yet, uh, but uh, you can contact me with any questions or uh, suggestions for things that I should look in on the show uh, for um, potential new topics or future episodes. Uh, and you can reach me at EngageBrain on Twitter or at my last name at Thanks so much. And we'll talk to you.